All right, so we're on lesson three, right? Lesson one, we talked about the general concepts of the kingdom. We understand what a kingdom is. Lesson two, uh, we talked about the first kingdom and the loss of the first kingdom. So now we're on lesson three, right? Yeah, they're fine. So the lesson three is going to be, it's going to be another good one. You'll have notes for lesson three. We're going to start off by the timing of God's kingdom. Okay, because that's very critical. Very critical. So according to the Bible, it's chronological, time. Now despite the concepts and theories of how old earth is, you know, there's a lot of different theories out there. Whatever you want to go with. Earth is billions of years old, thousands of years old. That's a minute point at this, at this time. It's not what I want to focus on, but I want to focus on let's just say that we are, the earth is 6,000 years old. Okay, let's just use that analogy instead of saying millions and millions. The creative act of God is making man to determine at least 6,000 years ago. If we were to use this measure to calculate the length of God's redemptive drama for mankind, then the promise of the coming Messiah King would have occurred 4,000 years before the birth of John the Baptist. How do we know this? Because God said that when Adam and Eve fell, that the woman will bruise the enemy, and he already foretold the prophecy of the Messiah way back in Genesis 3. So God waited 4,000 years before he sent himself to earth. The question becomes, why wait 4,000 years? Why not send them in 1,000 years? Why not send them that next year and save all humanity? Why wait 4,000 years? God is a great communicator. He knew that he could not fully reveal the good news of his kingdom until an environment existed in which people could understand the message. Only when the time was right could Christ come. Jesus could not come until a kingdom model existed as a visual illustration to keep people, to help people understand his teachings on the kingdom. Only in the fullness of time could the kingdom be revealed. When Jesus appeared preaching the kingdom, he was the culmination of thousands of years of preparation in God's plan. Four thousand years in the making, Jesus was. What was God waiting for? Throughout history, God was setting the stage and preparing an environment for the appearance of himself. The Babylonians fell to the Persians. That allowed the Jews to return back to their homeland and rebuild their temple in the city of Jerusalem. The Persians fell to the Greeks, whose great tradition and philosophy influenced the entire Mediterranean world. In time, the Greek Empire fell to the Romans with their genius for military campaigns, law, and government administration. At last, the time for which God could be, could, had been preparing drew near. The Roman Empire was the first in history with a structure and administration that resembled the kingdom of God. Finally, God had his model. Unlike the empires that preceded it, when Rome invaded and conquered a country, it set up its own administration with its own governing appointed by the emperor, by, but left the indigenous people in the land. So they'd come in, overtake it, and instead of taking the people out of the land, they left the people in the land, and they brought a governor to oversee the land and to convert them to their ideology. Rome governed its conquered territory through appointed representatives who ruled with the authority of the emperor himself. The job of a Roman governor was to govern his province in such a way as to make it a reflection of Rome. Rome became the greatest empire in history because it had a system of government that worked better than any other that had gone before it. It was a simple system. Take over territory, leave the people in the land, but appoint a governor and establish an administration that will turn them into Romans. Everything was now set. God's plan was finally coming into order. The Roman Empire provided the perfect model 
for the message of the kingdom because it contained the concepts of the kingdom that would make the message of Jesus easily understood. God's kingdom model was in place. The time had come for God, God to robe himself in flesh. That time had come for the kingdom to be revealed. Galatians 4 and 4, I said this earlier, says that when the fullness of time came, God sent his son into the world. He had to wait to the fullness of time. This means that God waited for the perfect timing. Jesus came at the just the right moment and place in history. What made this particular time 2,000 years ago right? What, what was so right about this? Among other things, the time was right because there was a great earthly kingdom in the place that could provide tangible, visible illustrations for Jesus' teaching about the kingdom. The Roman Empire served as a model. So God took the Roman Empire and says, like, this is the perfect structure. This is how my kingdom operates. The people know about this structure, so I can start introducing my kingdom to you because you understand what is going on here. Under Caesar, the Roman Empire was a kingdom, not a democracy. Caesar was a king, not a president. During Jesus' day, Rome ruled most of the known world. Its government, laws, institutions, and culture were everywhere. Every word that Jesus spoke about the kingdom had a physical equivalent in Rome, making his message easier to understand for the people who listened to him. For example, the Roman Senate was called an ecclesia. Ecclesia. Okay? It's a Greek word. That word means assembly or called out ones. So we know Greek and Latin were both widely spoken throughout the empire. The scholars and everybody believes most Hebrews spoke Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic, the common language of the Jews of the Palestine. But the Gospels were originally written in Greek, right? Our New Testament is in Greek. The Gospel writers use the word ecclesia in passages where Jesus talks about building his church. Just as Caesar had an assembly of called out ones, so Jesus would have his assembly of called out ones, the church. Caesar issued coins stamped with his image and inscription. People understood that whatever bore Caesar's image belonged to Caesar. And he had everything, he had everything, he had every right, and he could claim it. Likewise, they understood that whatever bore God's image and stamp of ownership belonged to God. And was his for the claiming. When we come to Jesus and give him our lives, the first thing he does is change our name. He gives us his name and calls us his sons and daughters. So the question becomes, do you bear his image? Do you bear his character? So now we know that the kingdom timing, we had to have the perfect timing for the kingdom. And God waited 4,000 years to have this model, this visible, visible representation so perfect timing's there. Now we have to prove something. Now we have to think about a mindset that we've been taught and we have to rethink some things because most of us believe that we're here from Earth, right? We don't believe we're from Mars or Venus. We, we believe we're from Earth. We, we and billions of other people live in hundreds of different countries, large and small, that cover the face of the earth. We order our lives according to the governments and structures of those countries. We eat our cultural food. We raise our families and our cultures. It's all we know. We only know our culture. We limit our whole lives to what on the planet, on the planet, because that's the way everybody has been living for thousands of years. We think, well, this is just the cards we've been dealt, and now we got to live with it. And it's just what it is. It is what it is. However, in reality, we've lost touch with something. Even those who claim to know the ultimate king, God, do not understand that we also belong to a country that supersedes any human countries we know about. We often think, and we've been taught, that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, and I have proved they are one and the same, we often use those terms 
that we paste into prayers, we paste into sermons, like they're just an add-on to the Bible. We are, we think that our country, and we don't consider that our home country here on earth is not really our true country. We think that the kingdom of God and heaven compromise compromises of some it's some invisible future destination and we think it's somewhere in the clouds somewhere and we think it's paradise and we think it's the sweet by and by that old hymn that we sing we think it's the sweet by and by the kingdom of god and the kingdom kingdom of heaven is the sweet by and by that's what we think that's what we've been taught now our Tuesday's message, I'm going to give you a little nugget here. Tuesday's message will be lesson five, and we'll be finishing up this specific series. And it's, uh, it's going to be hard for us. Okay, I'm going to give you a little nugget because the title is Religion Versus Relationship. And we're going to briefly touch on the subject here. But Tuesday, I have a whole lesson dedicated to that. So be prepared to get offended Tuesday. I like to give you that warning. There are many problems the religion of man has taught. One is we must suffer through this world and hold on until our Lord and Savior comes back on a white horse and takes us away from this world. That's what we've been taught. That's what religion teaches us. While simply waiting for the sweet by and by, we have to suffer while we're on this earth. We pray, Jesus, come back and save us from this world. And God is desperately trying to get his kingdom to manifest here on earth while we're trying to get into heaven. And God's like, no, it's, it's not about the sweet by and by. It's about heaven coming down to earth. It's not about you going to paradise. Religion has taught that the kingdom of God or heaven is the sweet by and by and it's when we get our crown of glory and we're walking on a street of gold that is not the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven it's not it when we talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven and instead of trying to repeat those I'm just going to refer to it as the kingdom that incorporates kingdom of God kingdom of heaven that is a reference to how he heaven operates the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same. Now, I can't just tell you that. I need to bring that out in the Bible and prove it. I can't just tell you my opinion. I need to bring forth scripture proving this. Matthew 19, 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So, we got verse 23 that says the kingdom of heaven. And then verse 24 says the kingdom of God. Right? Okay. Jesus is reinforcing an analogy here. Now, a pastor gave us a description, I believe it was last Sunday may have been the last Tuesday about the rich man and that, and that analogy. Okay, he gave us that example. And Jesus is reinforcing this idea, this thought. This is not talking about the afterlife, paradise, the sweet by and by, because there's going to be many rich people in heaven. Jesus is not referring to someone being rich. They can't go to paradise. Jesus was referring to the mindset of wealthy people. And I hesitate to use the word most because I feel like I'm casting a label on them. But some wealthy people have a different mindset. The joke everyone knows is rich people are cheap. That's why they stay wealthy. That's, that's kind of the thing that goes around. Rich people are cheap. That's why they're wealthy. Exactly. They know what to do with their money. They ain't going to waste it. It is hard for a rich man to understand the kingdom because in the kingdom, you give in order to get. 
but their business mindset says, I need to save and invest into things that return my investment. They do not realize that the kingdom is the greatest return because return than anything on earth. The kingdom gives you 30, 60, or 100 fold in what you have sown. You can't beat that in an earthly investment. And that's not talking about what you get in paradise. Again, Jesus is reinforcing this analogy. Everyone besides Matthew used the kingdom of heaven. All the other gospels use the kingdom of God, proving that they are the same. The next truth we need to look deep at is it's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven. It is not the kingdom in God. It is not the kingdom in heaven. The word of denotes possession, not location. It is heaven's kingdom. Kingdom of heaven. We can say the same thing with the Bank of America. If I say I'm going to conduct business at the Bank of America, you would assume that I'm going to a local branch. Not the headquarters of Bank of America. You're not going to assume that. It's the Bank of America. Not the bank in America of North Carolina. Same thing with the kingdom of heaven. Not the kingdom in heaven, although its headquarters is in heaven. Next concept of proving that the kingdom is not paradise. Everything Jesus talked about, he talked about in plain text. There were no parables. Jesus said that this is how you treat your spouse. This this is how you treat your kids. This is how you handle relationships. They're, he didn't speak parables when it came to that. But there's a huge difference when Jesus talks about the kingdom. He mentions it in code. He uses parables, illustrations. He only does that with the kingdom. The kingdom is like a mustard seed. It's, the kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field. It's, it's like a pearl. It's like a lost coin. The question is, why did Jesus talk in code about it? Matthew 13, 11, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. If Jesus was going to talk about heaven being the afterlife, and paradise, why would he use code? Why? Why use a parable to get to paradise? Why make your way to heaven a mystery? Why? Especially since everything else was in plain text when he talked about it. If the kingdom is about being saved, why did he not tell them straight up? If it's, hey, this is how you get to heaven, if that's what the kingdom is about. But instead, he didn't do that. He used parables. He used teachings. If the kingdom is the, after the second coming, when we are in heaven, how come Jesus says in Matthew 13, 24, another parable Put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Good. That's true. We get to that here in a second. If the kingdom. What? Oh. If the kingdom is about paradise, oh, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. So if the kingdom is about paradise, how can we have a man come in into paradise and steal something or sow bad seed? There's nothing bad in heaven. You're not going to be sowing in heaven. You're not going to be reaping in heaven. You definitely won't be having thievery in heaven. So, it's not talking about paradise. Because that wouldn't make any sense. How was it lost and then found? It makes no sense to say that the kingdom is about paradise. We have a thief on the cross with Jesus. He believes that Jesus was wrongly accused. And he even says, don't you guys fear God? I mean, he's up there and be like, look, Luke 23 and 40. But the other answering, rebuking, rebuked him, saying, 
Dost not thou fear God, seeing that seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing. He's saying, look, this dude did nothing. We, you and I deserve to be crucified, but this man did nothing. And then in verse 42, he says, And said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Okay? Now notice the thief said kingdom. Why would he use that word kingdom? Jesus taught for three and a half years. And what did he teach about? The kingdom. He didn't preach about the paradise. He didn't preach about the afterlife. He preached about the kingdom. So you know that for three and a half years, this, the kingdom talk had been spread throughout especially with Jesus doing his teachings and ministry and all that, you know everybody had to have been at the watering hole saying, did you hear about this kingdom thing? Now this thief did not know what the kingdom entailed. He didn't understand it. He probably had second and third foreknowledge. He just knows about this kingdom. So he makes the comment about remembering him when the kingdom comes. But Jesus changed it in verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He didn't say in the kingdom. He changed it. He says, No, 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 no. What you're thinking about isn't the afterlife. But I know what you're saying. You don't have any other, you don't have any understanding of it. So I need to change it. He says, No, it won't be the king. You'll be with me in paradise. Notice the thief said kingdom. Jesus said paradise, not the kingdom. There is a difference between the talk of being saved and the paradise and the kingdom. Well, we're going to go over some of them. These scriptures talk about being saved, and nowhere in there is the mention of a kingdom. Acts 16.31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. No kingdom mentioned there. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Nowhere is a kingdom mentioned. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and, not, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, nowhere is a mention of a kingdom in there. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So if the kingdom of heaven is at hand, how can it be talking about paradise? How can it be talking about your afterlife if it's at hand? Mark 1, 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Again, repent ye and believe the gospel. This right here should prove that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is not paradise. This should be proof right here. But we have been taught that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is the sweet by and by. It's afterlife. It's paradise. The work of Jesus did more than get you a ticket to heaven. But it was a carefully thought out plan of God to give us our rightful kingship back. To get us to a place our original purpose was meant to be. Almost every book in the Bible has some reference to the kingdom. Jesus talk about the kingdom. Goodness. All right. So, restoration of the kingdom. Okay? Now, I don't think you have the illustration in there. I don't think Pastor printed it. Did you, Pastor? Is the illustration in there? Nope. We can print some if you guys want. I'm going to draw it on the board for you. Right? Make sure I have uh, what I need here. Uh, I don't think it was in there. It might have been. All right, so 
we got Jesus, right? He's a king, right? Okay. He has a kingdom, right? And it's from heaven. Right? Okay. Got that, right? So, here we have heaven. Use a darker marker. Now you guys tell me. All right. So, we have heaven right here, right? What is heaven? The invisible realm, right? Then we have earth. Right? The physical representation of heaven. Right? The original kingdom was these two were supposed to operate together in parallel, right? That's what the original kingdom was meant. That's what Garden of Eden was. Earth operated just like heaven, right? Okay. No, what? Now I know not to use red. All right. So the very first message Jesus preached was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is a king. He made it very clear that he was bringing a kingdom. All he talked about was that kingdom. Yeah, he threw in a few things here and there, but the majority of his teachings and everything had everything to do with his kingdom. The kingdom belongs to God. It belongs to him, right? And it's from heaven. Okay, when God created the earth, it was never meant to operate outside of heaven. Heaven and earth were supposed to be in parallel with each other. You're fine. Can you guys see blue? Blue's pretty dark. Okay. All right, so we got Adam, right? We got Adam. And Adam operates earth. Right? Adam's in control of earth. Adam has dominion over earth. He speaks with his words and commands earth to do what he wants it to do. Okay? Then we got Satan. Okay? So, Adam and Eve fell because they ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, Adam forfeited that. And Satan came in, and he's now the god of this world. Bible says that. It says he's the prince of this world. Okay? So Adam forfeited his lease because God is the owner. Right? Adam had the lease. Now Satan has the lease. Okay? So, God says, all right, it's time. Jesus says, all right, time's fulfilled. Now it's time for me to do my thing, bring forth the kingdom, and take back this thing. I'm going to bring you keys to the kingdom. I'm going to give you dominion over earth. That's what the kingdom's all about. Okay, next, we have, that's a terrible B, born again Christians. And we fall under Jesus. So we are to take this and do it as well, right? Okay, we understand that, right? We understand that we are to operate earth just like it was in the Garden of Eden. But we don't. Jesus was not a religious man. He was a political man. The Bible is not a religious book. It is a political book. The book has nothing to do with a religion. God did not robe himself in flesh, teach for three and a half years, then die on a cross so we can have another religion. Just to keep us from going to hell. The Bible is filled with principle after principle, prophecy after prophecy, and throughout the book we can see glimpses of this kingdom. If God says that adultery is a sin, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Lesson one, we talked about what a kingdom is. We have an understanding of how a kingdom operates. We understand that a kingdom, it is not a democracy. They are two totally different worlds. That is why it is difficult for us, or believers, who were born into a democracy to live a strong kingdom life. We want to debate the issues or interject our own thoughts and opinions. We try to reach consensus or compromise to keep everyone happy instead of simply recognizing what the king's word is, that the king's word is law. If God says adultery is sin, then that is the word of the king. And his word is law. The matter is not open for discussion. We can debate God's words and decrees all day long and we will have a nothing accomplished. His word will still be law regardless of how bad you don't like it. No matter what humanistic philosophy preaches behind the pulpits, in schools, or our courts, God's law is absolute. In a democracy, citizens can gather to protest government policies and form committees and groups to the lobby of the legisl legislative bodies to change laws. That does not happen in a kingdom. God's word is absolute and his kingdom become his kingdom because it is set for all to see in the Bible which is the constitution of the kingdom the king has decreed that adultery is sin this is recorded in the constitution in article exodus section 20 subsection 14 thou shalt not commit adultery and in article leviticus section 18 subsection 20 Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. It's a constitution. These decrees and others like them are stronger than stone because they are the words of a king. His word is law and will never change. If we claim to be living the kingdom life, we cannot constantly be forming our own little groups and advance our own opinions to challenge the word of the king. As law, his word is non-negotiable. It is immutable. We run into problems every time we try to carry out our democracy mentality over into the kingdom life. Jesus came preaching about a kingdom. It was his main function. His main function was not to get you to heaven in paradise. That is not what he preached. He barely preached about salvation and going to heaven. Read your Bible. He did not talk about that. Very, very little did he ever talk about your laughter life. He talked about the kingdom. However, this kingdom is preached and most about it was a secret. Remember the question I posed earlier to you all. Why did Jesus talk in parables about the kingdom? It is a mystery and it's hidden. God purposely made the kingdom complex so the casual Christian could not inherit it. Now the question you ask yourself is why? Because if you understand the kingdom and its function in your life, you have keys that unlock doors. And as Uncle Ben from Spider-Man says best, with great power comes great responsibility. And see, here's, here's where we get. See, there's really three different aspects to the kingdom. There's the keys that we have that unlock heaven, that don't matter who you are. You don't have to be born again. You can be an atheist. They're keys. The world unlocks those keys from heaven all the time, 24-7. Then you have another aspect. Brother Dave talked about this. Then you have the kingdom inside you. Then there's a third aspect. The third aspect is bringing the kingdom here on earth. The kingdom is so powerful that you can ruin your life without even knowing it. The kingdom comes to the seeker. Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. Why? Because he knew they were only there for the fishes, loaves, and the healings. They didn't care anything about him or his kingdom. They just wanted that fish. They just wanted them loaves. They just wanted their servant healed. That's all they cared about. Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables. Why? Because he knew they were only there for those things. It was only made known to the disciples because they left all they had. Matthew 6 and 7 says, You don't cast your pearls before swine. And what did Jesus compare the kingdom to? A pearl. 
Jesus is not going to take the best stuff he has and just hand it out like the fishes and the loaves. It is important to note that as Brother Dave stated, you have the kingdom inside you and you have the third aspect, which is we have to bring forth heaven back on earth. You should be able to speak to weather and it move. You should be able to speak to diseases and they get healed. You should be able to speak to animals and they obey. That is what the Garden of Eden was all about. That is earth operating the same way as heaven. But yet we fail to do any of those. You heard the kingdom is like this, right? The kingdom is you heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But in God's kingdom... We love each other as ourselves. And we bless those who curse us. You have heard, you hit back. But in God's kingdom, you turn the other cheek. In the world's country, society tries to take and take, stepping on the next person's throat just to get one up. But in God's kingdom, the only way to increase is to decrease. Now, in lesson one, I gave a list of components that, that have a kingdom in it. We're going to go through those lists, but now we're going to incorporate God's kingdom in it. A king or lord is sovereign. That is God. A territory or a domain. That is earth. A constitution, a royal covenant. That's your Bible. A citizen, community of subjects, which is you and me. Law, which are acceptable principles. These are the Ten Commandments. Privileges, rights and benefits. These are promises of the Bible. A code of ethics, acceptable lifestyles and conduct. This is holiness and righteous living. An army, which is the security, which are the angels. A commonwealth, which is economic security. God loves all his children the same. He loves everybody the same, but he honors those who honor his principles. And there's a difference. A social culture protocol and procedures, honoring and character traits. Taxation. I made this one the last one. Money, animals, and food. Or tithing for us. 